Afternoon, everybody. Yeah. Don't come any bearing any tricks today. So, uh, before we get started, let me just uh, mention one quick item, which is I know many of you are closely following the ongoing negotiations out in Lausanne, Switzerland. We are too. Uh, as you saw, the president, uh, prior to the conclusion of his day here at the White House yesterday, uh, sat down with his national security team here in Washington and via secure video teleconference got an update from the negotiating team out in Switzerland about the latest uh, on the talks. Uh, the president has already been briefed again this morning. Uh, that briefing was required because the negotiating teams have been hard at work uh, since early this morning Europe time. Uh, I, don't, I do not have with me any sort of update in terms of the status of those talks or uh, a schedule for those conversations. Uh, updates along those lines are uh, updates that you can expect to receive from the team that's out in Switzerland. So with that um, preamble, and some might even consider it a warning, um, I'll go straight to your questions. Julie, do you want to start? Thanks, Josh. Yesterday, you were able to at least describe the talks in terms of making progress, making enough progress to continue on past this March 31st deadline. Are we in a, a place right now where that progress is continuing? Uh, the sense that we have is yes, that the, 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 the talks continue to be productive uh, and that progress is being made. Uh, I've observed uh, several times over the last few weeks that we have been at this for more than a year now. And the time has come for the Iranian negotiators to begin to make the kinds of serious commitments that the international community, including the United States, will insist upon. Uh, those are commitments related to demonstrating that they have shut down every single path to a nuclear weapon uh, and indicating a clear commitment to cooperating with an intrusive set of inspections. And uh, while the talks have been productive, uh, we have not yet received the specific tangible commitments that the international community seeks. So yesterday, when you described the productivity and the progress in the talks, you said as long as that continued, you'd be willing to go into Wednesday, today. Mm -hmm. If the progress continues today and there's no deal by the end of the day, or early evening in Switzerland right now, right. are you willing to go into Thursday or later into this week? Well, I don't have any update on the schedule simply because uh, it, it still is in the evening in Switzerland and they're still working on this. Uh, I would not, I think our approach to these conversations hasn't changed, which is that as long as we are in a position of convening serious talks that are making progress, that we would not arbitrarily or abruptly end them. But if we are in a situation where we sense that the talks have stalled, then yes, the United States uh, and the international community uh, is prepared to walk away because we've been very clear about what kinds of commitments we expect uh, and we've been clear about those kinds of commitments for in excess of a year. Uh, I don't, at the same time, I don't want to oversimplify what we're dealing with here. This is a very complicated situation and we want to be sure uh, that the, we're clear about the details. The details in the situation matter significantly. Uh, so. Uh, you know, those, those talks are in Switzerland are ongoing, and uh, we'll continue to monitor them from here. Uh, but for updates on the schedule, you know, we'll wait for those announcements to be made. Right, I just want to make sure I'm getting it right, because this is an important point. That if we okay. get to the end of today and there is no agreement, but there is still progress, you will extend it tomorrow. Well, uh, any, any type of schedule update like that would come from the negotiators. And I uh, am at this point reluctant to fast forward to what would happen at the end of the day if an agreement is not reached because they are still discussing an agreement right now as we speak. So I don't want to get ahead of uh, those ongoing negotiations. But I, I, I do think it's fair for you to assume that the approach that we demonstrated yesterday is one that we'll continue to demonstrate, which is uh, placing a priority on, um, on the productive nature of the talks and trying to reach an agreement. Can you give us any sense of what the president's uh, guidance or, or uh, mandate was to Secretary Kerry and Secretary Moniz in the, in the call yesterday? Um, I can't give you a lot of clarity about what the president uh, provided to them simply because they had a pretty detailed, robust discussion about the ongoing negotiations with the Iranians. And so to, to give you insight into what uh, instructions the president had would be talking about some of the core elements of the negotiations, which I've 
uh, gone to great lengths to avoid doing. So um, we've, we've avoided that for another year, so I'm going to try to avoid that for another day today. All right. And if I could just get you quickly to sure. um, give us any White House reacts to Governor Hutchinson in Arkansas coming out today and calling for changes to his state's uh, religious objections bill. Well, uh, the piece of legislation that was passed by the Arkansas legislature tracked closely with the legislation that was passed by the Indiana legislature last week. Uh, the kind of outcry that we saw in response to the Indiana legislation being signed into law by Governor Pence uh, is similar to the outcry that we saw in Arkansas last night after the legislature passed that legislation. We saw you know, pretty strong criticism, including from some pretty prominent uh, business leaders in the state of Arkansas expressing some concern uh, about the impact of that law and that that law could justifiably or could be used to justify uh, discriminating against individuals because of who they love. And that certainly is not consistent with uh, the values that the vast majority of Americans subscribe to. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, Governor Hutchison is obviously responding to that outcry. Um, but, you know, obviously the next step will be for the leaders in Arkansas to determine. I think we've been, we've made pretty clear uh, what our views are on that. Okay. Jeff. Josh, was the U.S. threat to walk away from the Iran talks real, or is that <coughs> a negotiating ploy? Well, uh, Jeff, all, all I can do is um, reiterate to you what our position has been, which is that we've been very clear, and when I say we, I mean the international community, the United States sitting at that table alongside our uh, German, French, British, Russian and Chinese counterparts, making clear to the Iranians that they need to make some specific commitments. And uh, if they're unwilling to make those commitments, that, then yes, the international community would be uh, in a position where we would be forced to consider alternatives to the approach that we've demonstrated so far. The President does continue to believe that diplomacy is the best way for us to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon, getting them to make commitments on their own to shut down every path to a nuclear weapon and to agree to uh, a set of intrusive inspections uh, is the most effective way for us to handle this situation. But it requires the Iranians to make some serious commitments. And they have, uh, those commitments at this point have not been uh, finalized and agreed to yet. But that's something that we're hard at work on. And as long as we continue to make uh, progress uh, in pursuit of that, of those commitments and those agreements, then, uh, then we'll do it. If diplomacy fails, what's the next step? Sanctions? Well, there are, I, I think this is one of the reasons that the President has advocated pursuing diplomacy so aggressively in the first instance. Uh, that is to say that uh, if, in the unfortunate event, that diplomacy is not successful, we'll continue to have a wide range of options on the table. Uh, that, that option would, those options include uh, coordinating with the international community to put in place even tougher sanctions that would compel Iran to come back to the negotiating table or to be, um, or to be more serious about the, about the discussions. Uh, there is, of course, a military option that's sitting on the table. Um, and this is, you know, again, in the unfortunate uh, circumstance that we could find ourselves in, which is that we're not able to reach an agreement, then the President will have to consider that range of options, and he'll do so uh, in close consultation with our P5 plus one partners. The unity of the international community has been critical to this, to the progress that we've made so far. Uh, but you certainly would also expect the President to consult uh, members of Congress on this as well. I know that there are some members of Congress who have floated the proposition that the joint plan of action, uh, uh, the interim agreement that many Republicans initially criticized, uh, could be one that could be extended. So there are a range of options that are available here. and. Uh, but I don't want to get ahead of where we stand in the process right now, which is that uh, talks are ongoing and, as, and we continue to make some progress. There seems to be a little bit of discrepancy from the people involved in the talks about where the disagreements lie and, and to what extent there are still disagreements. The Russian foreign minister said all key aspects have been agreed. Um, others in the room are not saying that. Can you clear that up? Well, I think. Uh, what I would observe is that if the agreement had been reached, we'd be having a different kind of conversation right now. Um, I think that is a pretty clear indication, and one I'm willing to admit to, which is that there are gaps that still remain in terms of trying to reach an agreement. And that's why the talks uh, are ongoing. And as long as those talks continue to be productive, uh, we'll try and 
uh, reach that uh, diplomatic agreement. Okay. Mark. Yeah, Josh Iran's uh, deputy foreign minister said that it was his understanding that there was going to be a text that's the product of this, this round, but that it would not have specifics in it. Is that an acceptable outcome? Well, again, I, I don't want to prejudge the uh, whether you know, some whether you will be able to do something is, is really not specific. Yeah. Well, I, let me. In general terms, what I will say is that the president has already committed to discussing and sharing with Congress, with our allies, what sort of commitments Iran has made in the context of this political agreement. Uh, and again, those are commitments that would verify that Iran had shut down every path they have to a nuclear weapon, and that they would uh, cooperate with a set of intrusive inspections. And so uh, those are those kinds of commitments, those kinds of that kind of an agreement is one that we would be interested in sharing with uh, others who are interested in the ongoing talks. And that includes our allies, that includes our partners in the region, that certainly includes members of Congress, and I think that includes uh, all of you who seem to be particularly interested in this as well. So the work product would have to be specific and in writing. Uh, we would, uh, again, we would want to be as transparent as we could, uh, and that means sharing a lot of details about what exactly Iran has committed to. Again, I, the, the international community has worked closely with the uh, United States as we've imposed the sanctions regime. Uh, and this is a very tough sanctions regime that's compelled Iran to the negotiating table. And that was the goal. The goal of putting in place these sanctions was to compel Iran to enter into negotiations and reach uh, a diplomatic agreement. So we have an obligation uh, to discuss what sort of agreement is reached with the international community. The same could be said of members of Congress who, on the front end, uh, passed statutory sanctions that were then coordinated with the international community. So uh, members of Congress who have been involved in this effort would have uh, a legitimate interest in understanding what sort of commitments Iran had made. So we would want to, uh, and we will be, uh, as the President has promised, uh, you know, sharing those commitments with uh, Congress as well. Okay. Jim. On the ground in Switzerland, who has the authority to walk away? Who has the authority to say this is no longer productive? Or does a call have to be made back to the United States, to the President, for the people in Switzerland to walk off the, way the table? Well, there is very close coordination that's ongoing between uh, the President, members of his national security team here at the White House, uh, and the leaders of the negotiating team out in Switzerland that include obviously Secretary Kerry and Secretary Moniz. So there's very close coordination that's ongoing, and um, the President's been, been uh, apprised of the, where things stand in terms of the talks, uh, and they're working together as they plot the path forward here. But the President obviously isn't there. If, if, if does, Senator, does uh, Secretary of State Kerry have the power, the ability, on the ground to say, the President uh, has given me the authority at this point to walk away. This is not productive. Or, do, or does there have to be uh, a break and a call back to the White House before that happens? Well, uh, again, we're sort of talking in hypotheticals at this point because right now the you could characterize the talks as, uh, as making some progress. And uh, I'm confident that if we were to reach the unfortunate point in this process where the United States had to make a decision to uh, leave the negotiating table because Iran was not being serious. We, of course, would do that in coordination with the international community, and I'm confident that the President would be involved in making a decision like that. But uh, again, that's just a hypothetical because we haven't reached that stage. Uh, but we'll see. Okay. Major. Josh, uh, separate from what may or may not happen in the next few hours, I want you to address something that Dennis Ross, who you know well, has just written in Politico, talking about his belief that what you're currently negotiating, and these are his words, does not reflect the objective we had hoped to achieve for much of President Obama's first term. By that he means no large in nuclear infrastructure within Iran, limited enrichment capability, very limited enrichment capability, an international fuel fund providing fissile fuel for Iran. What Dennis Ross now writes is that at some point the Obama administration changed its objective from one of transforming the Iranian nuclear program to one ensuring that it would not have a breakout time for a nuclear weapon of less than one year. Is that a fair assessment of the way this administration has changed its own self-defined benchmarks for what constitutes success in dealing with this question and the Iranians? Well, um, 
As far as I can remember, and obviously uh, Mr. Ross was uh, involved in a lot of these conversations in a more detailed fashion than I was, but it has been the clear principle of the United States since President Obama took office that Iran, while President Obama is in office, will not obtain a nuclear weapon. And it has always been our belief that the best way for us to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon is through diplomacy, where Iran voluntarily, essentially on their own accord, made some specific commitments that would make it clear to the international community that they're not able to obtain a nuclear weapon. And that has been our policy from the beginning. And um, I, would, I would also readily acknowledge that the success of that policy will be judged based on what sort of an agreement is reached. Uh, and so that's the reason that I would hesitate to get too far out in front here, because everybody, including Mr. Ross, will have an opportunity to evaluate uh, what kind of progress we've made in fulfilling that goal. That he is being accurate in his interpretation of what the early goals were. Well, again, I, I think um, I haven't read the, the op-ed that he has published, and there may be people, maybe we can follow up with you if there are specific aspects of the op-ed that uh, don't reflect the recollection of others who work here. But I do think as a general matter, what is true is that our policy when President Obama took office was to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon and that the best way for us to accomplish that goal is through diplomacy. Right. That and that's exactly what we're seeking to do. Right. That being said, there is a qualitative argument here as to what remains within Iran and the separate question of obtaining a nuclear weapon. Because if a lot of infrastructure remains, the potential there is greater technologically and the speed with which it can ultimately achieve that is less. And what I read from Dennis Ross is saying the original objective was to essentially make that question far less pressing by transforming what Iran had and making it far less technically possible to achieve that possession of a nuclear weapon. Well, and there so in that sense, what he's arguing is, in some ways, the Iranians have already won at the negotiating table, achieved far more from their perspective than this administration would have originally been comfortable with. Well, I would vigorously disagree with that conclusion, uh, only because our principal goal, again, was to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon, and that the most effective way for us to do that was at the negotiating table. And uh, we'll, everyone will have an opportunity, once an agreement is reached, if an agreement is reached, to evaluate whether or not we've accomplished that goal. But if we're able to get the kinds of commitments that we would like to see from the Iranians to shut down every pathway they have to a nuclear weapon, and to see their compliance with a set of intrusive inspections measures. Uh, that would be accomplishing the goal that we set out to achieve from the very beginning in a way that is clearly within the best interests of the national security interests of the United States, but also in the best interests of our closest ally in the region, Israel, uh, and our other partners that are important to our national security in the region, including Saudi Arabia. Is it the President's plan to communicate with the country once a decision has been made that he has communicated to the Secretary of State about whether to continue with these negotiations? Um, are you asking if the president will to to speak us. publicly well, whatever he's if an agreement is reached? About if an agreement is reached, or if he's ordered the secretary of state to come home and uh, reassemble the uh, strategy to see what comes next? Yes, I would. I would anticipate that in either uh, eventuality uh, that you would hear from the president about would that it. Be today? Uh, well, I think it depends on where the where the talks go. But that's a clever way to ask that question, though. <laughs> Mr. Vicara. Thank you. Josh, given the June 30th expiration of the agreement that's now in place, what is the drop dead date for completing this phase of the talk? Mm -hmm. Well, Mike, we continue to be in a place where uh, the international community has been negotiating with Iran for in excess of a year. Uh, and they're very serious commitments that we're seeking from Iran. And we have essentially reached the end of those negotiations. And it is time for uh, Iran to demonstrate whether or not they're willing to make those serious commitments, that we've had an opportunity to explore all of these issues in great detail. Uh, that's been done at very high levels. Uh, obviously, the Secretary of State has himself been personally involved. It's also been involved, uh, this, these discussions have also been um, conducted at a very technical level, too. You know, we have Secretary Moniz, who has been participating in these conversations for a number of weeks now. Uh, Secretary Moniz is one of the foremost nuclear security uh, or nuclear energy experts. Uh, in the world. He also happens to be the Secretary of Energy in the United States. So he's well positioned to participate in these talks at a, in a technical way. Uh, and they've had ample opportunity to do that. And that's why um, you know, we are at a point where it's time for Iran to uh, make these decisions that the international community is insisting upon. You 
mentioned a couple of options if, in fact, the talks don't succeed, if they fail. One would be more sanctions, one would be a military option, which you say is still on the table. If, in fact, you do have to walk away, how quickly would those sanctions be re uh, those sanctions be ratcheted up? Well, the uh, it's, it's hard to say uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that the, the joint plan of action, this interim agreement that was struck over a year ago, would remain in place through June 30th. Uh, and so there would be a, um, there already would be something, uh, an agreement between the international community and Iran that uh, would have some limitations on their nuclear program already. And then need more stick between now and June 30th if you're going to get them back to the table and avert a complete abrogation of the existing agreement. Uh, that's certainly possible, but again, it'll depend on the circumstances of, uh, uh, of where things stand. So it's hard to, it's hard to speculate about that now. But and finally, um, there was talk yesterday of perhaps a broader, broader wording to an interim agreement um, that would, had been hoped for by many of the parties in terms of the specificity on things like the breakout time, the number of centrifuges, the amount of uranium, uh, the inspections, the, the lifting of the sanctions, things of that nature. Is it a concern of the U.S. and, the, and the, your partners uh, that Iran, Iran is, is trying to get away from these talks with something that's broader, less specific, that was going to would cause you problems here in Washington mm -hmm. in a couple of weeks. There's well, the concern is that we have made we've been pretty insistent, in fact, uh, about Iran making some serious commitments that would resolve the international community's concerns about their nuclear program in a way that would demonstrate that they're not able to obtain a nuclear weapon. And what we envision for the essentially this week that we're in now is. Uh, Iran reaching a political agreement with the international community, whereby they would make clear, sort of as a general matter, what sort of a, uh, an agreement they're willing to participate in. Uh, and that would provide a framework for a more detailed agreement that would have to be negotiated by the end of June. Uh, and we would expect out of this political agreement some clarity about what exactly they are prepared to do. But I would not anticipate a scenario where each of these details has been locked down, that, there, that the negotiations are structured in such a way that we can essentially get this top-line political agreement that would impose a framework on the next round of negotiations that would delve into the technical details. Uh, and uh, so it's that sort of overarching general framework that we're seeking. But, uh, but, I, but at this point, uh, everyone will have an opportunity when a deal is reached, if a deal is reached, to evaluate what exactly the commitments that Iran uh, is willing to make uh, in terms of that top line framework. But uh, what I will, I'm confident being in a position of saying then, if an agreement is reached, that the details of this are important uh, and the guidelines that we've set out make it pretty clear where we're headed in terms of an agreement, uh, but that we're going to dig into the details and make sure that every I is dotted and every T is crossed and every uh, decimal is uh, not just rounded up or rounded down, but actually closely examined in terms of what sort of impact it would have on their nuclear program. And those will be painstaking, detailed negotiations that uh, I'm confident we'll uh, spend a lot of time talking about over the course of the spring. So I'm sure you're looking forward to that as much as I am. Well, I'm becoming an expert. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. James. Josh, thank you. Uh, with your indulgence and that of my colleagues, I'd like to pursue a short series on Iran, a short series on Iraq, and then one question of pure politics. Um, on Iran, forgive me for saying so, but I think that from this podium, both yesterday and today, we've heard some divergent messages from you as to how long the administration and the P5 plus one are willing to let these negotiations last. Yesterday you stated, I'm paraphrasing but faithfully, uh, as long as these conversations continue to be productive, we'll continue to have them. You also stated yesterday, however, that the U.S. and its partners would not wait until June 30 to walk away if necessary. Mm -hmm. So right there are two divergent questions, or two divergent statements, I should say. So is it the case that you'll have them as long as they're productive, or there is actually some sort of ticking clock here? Well, um, I think what I would try to help you understand, James, in terms of our position, is that we do not envision a scenario where we would abruptly and arbitrarily end the talks that are productive. Uh, but at the same time, these conversations are not open-ended, uh, that we have been serious about the way that we believe it is most effective for us to structure these negotiations, uh, and that is to structure these negotiations in a way that a 
framework agreement, essentially a political agreement, could be reached uh, by the end of March is what we said. We're in April 1st now um, because we want to preserve uh, ample time, uh, you know, essentially two or three months for the technical experts to then sit at the table uh, and have a conversation about how the numbers are going to work inside this broader framework agreement. And we believe it's important to leave ample time for those conversations. And so uh, that's why um, I have been unwilling to set a uh, definitive, though arbitrary, date, uh, but at the same time been tried to be clear about the fact that we're not operating in an open-ended environment here. So when you tell us, and you said the same thing yesterday, that it could be negotiated the real fine technical details within a two to three month period. <coughs> if that period is two months, that would give us room for another month of negotiations. Can we expect that you're willing to go do this for still the whole month of April? Well, again, I don't want to speculate about um, you said two to three uh, months about this one. I, I did. I did. So if it's two months. That gives us the whole month of April. Mm -hmm. Well, I, we have, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we've been at this for more than a year. Uh, and it's very clear what kinds of commitments we're seeking from Iran, and it's time for them to make some decisions about whether or not they're willing to make those commitments. Last on this series, did you mean to suggest, as I think you did earlier in this briefing, that one of the options available to the U.S. and the international community here is for the JPOA to be extended beyond June 30? Did you mean to suggest that that's on the table? Well, what I, have what I uh, meant to suggest is that there are some Republicans who, when asked what they would these are Republicans who have, are on the record. The well, but that's about this administration and its desires. Is right. the JPOA being extended on the table or not? Mm -hmm. The context in which I brought this up is the context of what would happen if diplomacy fails, if we're not able to reach an agreement. And what some Republicans, I'm speaking of the, uh, uh, the chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, uh, Senator Corker, a number of weeks back, indicated that one approach could be uh, leaving the joint plan of action in place, this, this potential agreement. So that is an, an option that could be in place uh, if uh, negotiations do not uh, succeed. But uh, right now, negotiations are underway in Switzerland and they're making progress. On to Crete, can you please share with us the assessment of the United States government as to the state of the battle there, um, who is running the city, and the success of military operations there designed to uh, repelling ISIS from there? My colleagues at uh, the Department of Defense can certainly give you some more details about this, but it is our assessment that Iraqi forces under the command of the Iraqi military and the Iraqi central government uh, have advanced into the heart of Tikrit, that they have succeeded in uh, taking uh, the city's center uh, and other significant areas of the city from ISIL. Now, uh, we're very mindful of the fact that uh, in these kinds of military operations, there can be a little bit of back and forth. Uh, but what's clear is that they've made uh, important progress even in just the last couple of days. And this is notable progress because you'll recall that uh, when this operation began, it did not include the support of coalition military airstrikes. And uh, after a few productive days, this operation essentially got stalled right on the outskirts of the city and remained stalled for a couple of weeks. Uh, five days ago, the uh, Iraqi military made a specific request to the United States to back their efforts with uh, military airstrikes, uh, and we've seen over the course of the, the last five days that the stalemate that had previously been in place for a couple of weeks uh, had receded, uh, and that uh, Iraqi security forces that were multi-sectarian in nature, right, these included Shia military, uh, these included members of the Popular Mobilization Force, these included some tribal fighters as well, uh, were able to advance uh, into the city. Uh, and this is, uh, if you take a look at what's happened over the last five days, uh, I think a pretty compelling uh, description of the, sex, the successful implementation of our strategy, that we have said all along that a multi-sectarian force that's being led by the Iraqi military and a unified Iraqi central government, uh, that that force would be effective, but would be made even more effective when backed by coalition military airstrikes. And, and, and again, Shia militia. And, uh, and Shia militia. That's what we've seen over the last five days. I'd point out that Shia militia, though, is under the command of the Iraqi military and of the Iraqi central government, and that's key. There are some Shia military units or Shia militia fighters who I think were at least ambiguous about whether or not they were under the command of the Iraqi military. And we saw that there were some uh, Shia military, militia fighters who declined to participate in the operation once a coalition military air power was involved. 
Uh, and again, what the United States insisted on was a, a as an operation that was multi-sectarian under the command of the Iraqi military. And uh, again, based on what's happened over the last five days, I think uh, this is a pretty clear piece of evidence uh, uh, that is uh, that this strategy that we've laid out is one that uh, has some potential uh, in terms of uh, driving back ISIL fighters. In Mosul, too? Well, I, each of these situations is different. And there are certainly elements of this operation that could be useful in Mosul. This idea of ensuring that this multi-sectarian force is the one that's carrying out the operation, making sure that every element of that multi-sectarian force is reporting to the military command uh, and to the uh, Iraqi central government, uh, and that their capabilities are enhanced when they're backed up by coalition air power. Now, what's also true is that Mosul is a much larger city than Tikrit. Uh, there are also, based on some reporting that we see on the ground, there are also substantially a uh, larger number of civilians inside Mosul than there have been in Tikrit. Uh, and uh, that makes an, any sort of operation like this more complicated because we obviously go to great lengths to uh, prevent innocent uh, civilian deaths. Final question, Goldman, very patient, and I appreciate it. This is the pol politics question. Yes. In his remarks at the Edward M. Kennedy Institute the other day, the President lamented that our politics today are not more purposeful and elevated, to use his words. And he also lamented that too often ideology gets in the way of basic respect. And those remarks struck me because this week we saw my CNN colleague Dana Bash uh, do an interview with House, the, speaker, uh, the Senate Minority Leader, Harry Reid, in which she asked him about his decision in the midst of the 2012 presidential campaign to take to the Senate floor and accuse Mitt Romney of not paying his taxes and demanding that Mitt Romney, in fact, prove he paid his taxes. And when Dana Bash asked him about this, she mentioned that some people considered it McCarthyite. And of course, no evidence has ever been produced to show that Mitt Romney failed to pay his taxes. But I wonder if President Obama, who has lamented this incivility in our politics, this disrespect in our politics, has any view of Harry Reid telling Dana Bash in response to this question, well, Romney didn't get elected, did he? Well, I, I haven't had the opportunity to talk to the President about uh, uh, Senator Reid's interview. Obviously, uh, Senator Reid is uh, somebody who's going to decide for himself about uh, what he says on the Senate floor. And he obviously is a vocal supporter of the President. And they have a partnership that will go down in history as a remarkably productive one. Uh, but ultimately, it's, uh, it's up to Senator Reid to decide uh, you know, what he's going to say on the House floor. And, uh, there are a number of things that Senator Reid, over the course of his career, I think that he has uh, said pretty proudly, were uh, independent uh, of the views of anybody else. They represented only his own. But it's the President's choice and his spokesman's choice to call out conduct unbecoming of our highest elected officials when it is, in fact, unbecoming. Are you going to take that opportunity now? Uh, not for something that's uh, three years old. Chris. If I can just follow up on, on to pre very briefly, you said that um, obviously the Iraqi forces uh, are effective but are more effective with airstrikes. You're not suggesting, or are you suggesting, that Tikrit could have been taken with those forces alone without those precision airstrikes? Well, uh, I think that's a, uh, that's a counterfactual that's hard to know at this point. But what is clear is that we had seen an operation be mobilized uh, by the uh, Iraqi military with Iraqi security forces in conjunction with some other uh, loosely affiliated Shia militias that had carried out an operation against Tikrit that essentially had stalled up in the outskirts of the city or at least on the outer edges of the city. And it was only, and that, and that, that had been stalled out for a couple of weeks, uh, and it's only in the last five days that uh, coalition military airstrikes were carried out. Uh, and that military forces under the command of the Iraqi military and the Iraqi central government uh, did advance into the city. Uh, and that did cause, uh, apparently, uh, ISIL fighters to withdraw. Um, and you know, again, there can always be a, a little back and forth in these kinds of military operations. But what is clear is that over the last five days, this strategy of backing up uh, Iraqi security forces that are multi-sectarian in nature with uh, coalition military airstrikes uh, is a pretty potent combination. And let me ask you really quickly about um, Iran. And you said that the President wants to be clear. He wants to be able to share with Congress, with the American people, 
uh, be able to essentially make his case for this deal if there is a deal. So would that suggest that whatever statement that might come out of this would have to have some specificity? Understanding it's not going to be completely detailed, but would it have to have some specificity and be a written statement? Well, we would expect, again, I don't want to prejudge the outcome here, but we certainly would expect uh, the whole point of this exercise has been for Iran to demonstrate their willingness to make serious commitments uh, to the international community uh, about their nuclear program uh, and ensuring that they do not obtain a nuclear weapon. And so we would expect uh, for those serious commitments to be made uh, soon because we've been doing this uh, for more than a year now. Uh, and the President expects to be in a position to talk publicly about what sort of commitments uh, Iran has made. So uh, in what form that takes, uh, we'll have to see uh, if an agreement is reached. Uh, but that's what our expectation is. So not necessarily a written statement that the Iranians sign off on? Well, again, it's, it's hard to imagine the President going out and making the case that, well, this is just what the Iranians have told me they're willing to do. Uh, I, uh, I think you can uh, – you can certainly expect that the President would expect a more serious commitment from the Iranians than that in order to move forward. And last question, Jason Chaffetz, uh, uh, late yesterday issued subpoenas demanding the testimony from those two Secret Service agents who were involved in this recent incident where a bomb scene, an active bomb scene was breached. Uh, will the administration uh, resist those subpoenas? Well, ultimately this will be a decision that uh, will be made by the Department of Homeland Security and by the Secret Service. The the fact that the director of the Secret Service over the last couple of weeks has appeared before Congress uh, at least three times, I think, is an indication of their willingness to cooperate with legitimate oversight. Uh, that same director has also referred this specific matter to the Inspector General to ensure an, uh, a genuinely independent uh, investigation into what occurred that evening. So I think that ind indicates a pretty clear commitment on the part of the leadership of the Secret Service to both cooperating with legitimate congressional oversight uh, and actually getting to the bottom of what happened uh, that night. But, but as you know, uh, part of the concern of some members of that committee has been that uh, because the director said he didn't want to interfere with the inspector general's investigation, he had not, did not have all the facts, he did not do the questioning, he did not speak to all the people involved. So while he indeed, as you've said, has gone before the committee, their argument is that they need to be able to speak to the people directly involved. Well, I know that it's not unprecedented for inspectors general uh, to go before Congress and to talk about the results of their investigation. And uh, in this case, there's an independent inspector general at the Department of Homeland Security that's conducting this investigation. So um, that independent inspector general will conduct this investigation, and uh, that person will have to decide whether or not they're prepared to testify before Congress about their findings. Okay. April. Couple of subjects okay. um, on Iran. Can you explain uh, the military option as the United States is still trying to find out the uh, arsenal, the weapons arsenal that Iran has? Well, uh, April, I, I, I would not talk. Uh, I'm not prepared to talk uh, in great detail about what sort of specific military options the president would consider, uh, other than to say that a military option is among those that's on the table. One of the downsides, however, of the military option is that it would have less of an impact in terms of setting back uh, Iran's nuclear program than, a, um, than the kind of diplomatic agreement that we currently envision. Uh, we also know that the diplomatic agreement that we're trying to reach is one that would include uh, intrusive inspections that would give the international community uh, great insight into the scope of Iran's nuclear program. And the, we know that a military action would have the opposite of that effect, right? That if uh, Iran were in a position where they were subject to military action, it seems very likely that they would kick all the inspectors out of the country. Uh, and that me, we would, moving forward, have less insight into the size and scope of their nuclear program. So uh, that is why the President makes aggressively the case, as I have, that the diplomatic path is the most effective way for us to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. I'm trying to marry the, and I hear what you're saying, but I'm trying to marry the issue of potential what is possibly could happen, military options on the table, even though you say that it's not as effective as sanctions. But then you have an issue that you are, we don't have the intelligence that we would like on what kind of weapons that they have. 
wouldn't mil a military <laughs> option, a potential a military option, just cancel all of that out? I mean, because we do not know what they have. Mm -hmm. Well, April, right now we do have more insight into their uh, into their nuclear program than probably than we ever have because of this joint plan of action. This interim agreement, as you'll recall, uh, included um, wide-ranging inspections, uh, and that has provided greater insight into the size and scope of Iran's nuclear program. That is, after all, the basis for a lot of these discussions, that as we sort of talk about uh, what their nuclear program looks like now and what it would look like under uh, a diplomatic agreement, uh, is rooted in the fact that uh, we have some basic knowledge of their program. And what we would envision is a diplomatic agree agreement that would, uh, again, cut off every pathway they have to a nuclear weapon, but also give uh, intrusive ac access to international inspectors so that they can verify Iran's compliance with that agreement. And on another subject, uh, the commutation letter uh, that was issued yesterday from the White House, um, many of those uh, uh, who the sentences were commuted, um, they were uh, dealt with drug sentencing, drug convictions. Is this part of the President's um, idea of uh, bringing that disparity gap in sentencing, uh, particularly when it comes to crack cocaine versus powder cocaine from 100 to 1 to 18 to 1, is this part of that uh, effort that he's, he's uh, employing trying to uh, bridge the gap in sentencing disparity? Well, I can say as a general matter, April, that the people who received commutations from the President yesterday were individuals who, uh, or at least the vast majority of them were individuals who would have faced a different sentence uh, had they, their sentence been considered under current law. Uh, and this is just one example of the kinds of disparities that exist in our criminal justice system, and it's why the President uh, is working in bipartisan fashion on legislation that would resolve some of those inequities. Uh, and this would have uh, consequences not just for the just way in which our laws are applied, uh, but also has some consequences for public safety and even for uh, the finances of our country. So there are a lot of reasons for Democrats and Republicans to be interested in this issue. Uh, and the President, uh, foremost in the mind of the President, is making sure uh, that our criminal justice system lives up to our own commitment as a country to being one that's both uh, impartial and fair. Is this one of those gaps that the President is trying to close, like you said, on the way to Selma when he talked to the black journalist on the flight down? You were one of them. I sure was. And, uh, and this is kind of going along with the question I asked in his answer. Yeah. He said that uh, his job now is to basically bridge the gaps of the racial divide that still is going, in the, going on in the country. Is this one of those gaps that he's trying to, the racial gaps that he's trying to close? Well, there are certainly um, there are certainly concerns broadly in our justice system uh, about about fairness, uh, and some of them uh, do relate to questions of race. And the fact is, the president believes, and unfortunately, there are Democrats and Republicans on Capitol Hill who also believe that there are some common sense changes that we can make to our justice system that will make it more fair. Uh, and the President's interested in having that conversation and trying to advance that goal. Uh, the tool of commutations is just one that the President can use to try to add some more uh, fairness and justice to that system. Uh, but there are some legislative changes that could also be made that would have an even more profound effect on the system. Okay. Michelle? Hi. Uh, on this business of the deadline, I, I understand that you're saying that while progress is being made, why, you know, bring it to a halt. But can you just explain the logic of not putting an end to this phase? Because there was a logic in making a deadline for in the first place. That's right. Um, so why not give them until this amount of time to show that they're serious about those commitments? Well, I think, Michelle, the reason for that simply is that the we're at the end of the negotiations as it relates to trying to reach a political agreement. And it is time for Iran to demonstrate whether or not they're willing to make these serious commitments that the international community has been asking for. And it is in the mind of the President and the broader international community that this is the best way for us to ensure that Iran does not obtain a nuclear weapon. But it's going to require Iran to make some serious commitments. And after negotiating for more than a year, uh, it's essentially time for Iran to make that decision. But it sounds like they're not serious enough to make that decision when we gave them an end point. And it seems like we're giving them leeway here, no? No, I, I think what we are insisting on is we're insisting on a good deal. 
uh, and that if Iran is serious about fulfilling, uh, making these commitments, uh, and is serious about trying to reach an agreement with the international community around the negotiating table, uh, the time has come for them to make that decision. Uh, and we'll see. What we've heard from Iran publicly has been it wouldn't be the end of the world if no deal was reached. Um, on the issue of their stockpile, they said, well, no, no, no we're not going to move our stockpile. So it sounds like what they're saying publicly is that there are certain points on which they're not that serious. And I know that you've said that what's said publicly is not the same as what goes on in negotiations. But are we getting a lot of indication from Iran that they're just not that serious? Well, uh, Michelle, I think we'll be able to evaluate whether or not they're serious based on uh, what an agreement looks like if we're able to reach an agreement. Uh, and I think that will be the best way for us all to judge. Uh, and hopefully we'll have that opportunity uh, relatively soon. Okay, quickly. Um, we heard from France this morning saying that Iran is not where they're supposed to be at this point. I, they, they just sounded very pessimistic about the progress that has been made. They said, yeah, there's progress, but not on those specific points. So can you just tell us why on the progress that has been made, you sound much more optimistic than some of the other partners sound? Well, um, it's hard for me to account for uh, exactly the comments that were made presumably in French, by, uh, by the French foreign minister. What I'll say is that the, what has contributed significantly to the leverage of the international community is our unity on this measure. That the international community broadly uh, is united in insisting that Iran make serious commitments to resolve our concerns with their nuclear program and to verify that they will not obtain a nuclear weapon. And our negotiating position has been firm. Uh, and, you know, I've seen there's, I know that there is some reporting that indicates that, well, you know, maybe the fact that the, we're a day past the deadline is an indication that the international community is, uh, is really eager for an agreement. Uh, I actually would, would posit to you that the reason that we're a day past the deadline is because the international community is insisting on a good deal. Uh, and that we're going to drive a hard bargain and we're going to uh, expect Iran to make serious commitments. And we're going to give them the opportunity to do so. Uh, but if they don't, the international community, uh, alongside the United States, uh, is prepared to walk away and consider some uh, some alternatives. At this point, you, you're optimistic, even even given where we are now. Well, I, I don't know if I would go that far. I think I, what I would say is that we have made progress uh, in recent days, but there, uh, the reason that there's not an agreement is because there continue to be differences on some important issues, uh, and it's only through resolving those differences that we'll be able to reach an agreement and. Uh, time will tell whether or not that is possible, uh, but based on the amount of time that's already been expended uh, and dedicated to these negotiations, uh, that time's coming soon. Okay? Alexis. Josh, I want to ask a question and I want to follow up on what Michelle was asking you. What is the President's explanation or what explanation can you share for why the representatives from France, China, and Russia departed? Mm -hmm. Well, I think you'd have to ask them about what sort of uh, scheduling uh, matters they had to deal with. The, the one thing that I will observe about the French foreign minister is that his flight to Lausanne is uh, pretty brief. So it's much easier for him to go back and forth than it is for uh, my American counterparts who are doing yeoman's work over in Switzerland. But in no way uh, is the president want us to believe that their departure <coughs> signals a lack of progress. No, I would not interpret it that way. That there, you know, we, are, we're get, we continue to be in touch with our, all of our international partners, even if uh, they are not represented at the foreign minister level in these talks. And are there any other conversations that the President has had with heads of state regarding the Iran talks? Uh, uh, not that I'm aware of today, but if, uh, if there's an opportunity for us to give you greater insight into that, we'll let you know. Okay. And one other follow-up on Iran, and then I have a domestic question. And that is, um, there was a lot of Twitter chatter last night that what today was going to be about was actually drafting. And I just want to clarify that the administration's understanding about what's happening in Switzerland is negotiating or drafting? Well, uh, I think I would only, uh, because I'm reluctant to get into a lot of detail about what's happening behind closed doors in Switzerland, um, I think I would only point out that there's not a significant difference between those two verbs. It's possible. That, that the it's, possible the it's possible to do both. The, uh, to do both. It's okay. possible to negotiate as you draft or to draft as you negotiate, I suppose. Um, Good to know. Uh, domestic question. The President is going to be visiting Kentucky and Utah, two nice states, but not necessarily states that 
we expect him to advance his news and agenda. So can you uh, lift the veil on what he hopes to achieve with his town halls in those two states? Well, we'll have some more uh, details about these visits, but certainly the President is looking forward to the opportunity to drawing a pretty stark contrast between uh, his middle class economics approach to expanding opportunity for everybody uh, and the approach that's advocated by Republicans, which essentially is a top down approach. And I do think you can expect the President to uh, repeat his concerns about uh, at least one aspect of the Republican plan, which is the elimination of the estate tax. Uh, just as a reminder to everybody, this is an estate tax provision that would uh, essentially offer a tax break that's targeted only at estates worth in excess of $11 million. Uh, and this is a tax loophole that Republicans are seeking to carve out that would actually cost $300 billion over 10 years. Uh, the President does not believe that that is a fiscally responsible approach. Uh, it's particularly ironic that uh, a day or two after Republicans uh, proudly voted on a budget that they said balanced, uh, that they're prepared to blow a hole in deficit uh, just so they could extend tax breaks to people worth more than $11 million. Uh, that certainly is one way that the President could illustrate the difference in approach between Democrats and Republicans on economic issues. And that's Kentucky. Uh, I think the President will have an opportunity to make that point in both places, I believe. Okay. Mara. Um, I have a quick question on Iran yes. and also Ripra. You said that if the talks fall apart, that you consult with your allies about tougher sanctions. I thought that the, you, the administration had argued in the past that if these talks fell apart, it would be hard to keep the international uh, solidarity on sanctions together. Uh, the concern that we've had if, was if the United States could be blamed for the talks falling apart, then it would be hard to preserve international uh, unity around the implementation of sanctions. But in this scenario, it's pretty clear that we've given uh, Iran every opportunity to make the kinds of serious commitments that the international community expects. Uh, and at this point, if we're not able to reach an agreement, I think the international community would understandably uh, hold Iran responsible for that shortcoming. Okay. And on RIFRA, um, in Arkansas, governors sent the law back for, clarif for, to, for a rewrite, basically. And in, in Indiana, the governors asked for clarifications. Does the president, as a constitutional lawyer, believe that it is possible to allow private businesses to um, not perform certain services for gay couples without it being discrimination? Is it, in other words, is this a circle that can be squared or, or not? Well, I haven't had, uh, I haven't had that discussion with him. I, I do think that uh, in the mind of the President, the, uh, the thought that we would have state legislatures in the 21st century in the United States of America passing laws that would uh, use religion to try to justify discriminating against people because of who they love is unthinkable. Uh, and that's why I think that you've seen an outcry, uh, again, not just from Democrats. This hasn't been a, a partisan or even a particularly political dispute. Uh, it's business interests. It's other Republicans. It's other leaders in the faith community who've stepped forward and said, uh, particularly in the case of Indiana, uh, that this, this law is a terrible idea. It's not good for our state. It's not consistent with our values. Uh, and, uh, I, you know, I think that, uh, that outcry is what has prompted uh, Governor Pence to reevaluate the wisdom of signing this bill into law, something he did just a few days ago. Uh, and I think it's also what has made Governor Hutchison so reluctant to sign this bill and to actually uh, send it back to the legislature so they could do some additional work on it. So, so you don't see this in any way analogous to the kind of carve-out or opt-out you've offered to religious institutions on contraception, for instance? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think this, this matter is, is broadly different uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, Tolu. Thank you, Josh. You, you've in the past, you've talked about how um, different people who have been looking at these negotiations have cherry-picked different parts of the negotiation uh, as, as they've tried to oppose it. If we do reach a deal, you mentioned it's going to be incredibly complex. How is the president and the administration going to get across the, the, the parts of the deal to the American public so that people understand it? And how will you counter the folks who are going to maybe cherry, park, cherry pick the parts of the deal that people might not like. Um, how, how are you going to go about rolling this out? Well, some of that is we're going to be counting on all of you uh, to tell the truth about uh, what's included in the agreement. And so we're certainly going to spend some time talking to all of you about what the details are of the agreement and uh, what consequences that would have for our national security. Uh, some of that will also, uh, the other thing I, should, I guess I should clarify is that the agreement that we're trying to reach right now is a political one. So essentially it would be a generalized framework. And 
while the issues that are at play here are complicated, um, you know, what we're envisioning is a pretty general framework that uh, somebody who spends some time looking at it should be able to understand. Down the line, when we get to June and we start negotiating, or we, we hopefully end negotiating uh, over the very technical details, uh, that's when we're going to enter up uh, a, a phase where the scientific details are pretty complicated. Uh, the other thing that I'll point out, and this is, I guess, something else that you could be on the lookout for uh, in the days ahead if an agreement is reached, uh, is that I would anticipate that we will make not just a public case to try to persuade you and the American people and members of Congress and our allies that this is clearly in the national security interest of the United States. We'll also have a scientific case to make, that we'll be able to make a pretty forceful case that, if you, that looking at the science, that we've reached an agreement that has effectively uh, prevented Iran from uh, obtaining a nuclear weapon. And that will be you know, part of the uh, explanation and description that we'll uh, offer to all of you. On the, on the deadline and the, sort of the, the, the decision to push the deadline past yesterday, is that in part a, a negotiating tactic that if this fails, you will, as you mentioned earlier, sort of be able to put it on, on Iran and, and not it? Um, it won't be blamed on the U.S. having this hard, arbitrary deadline. Is that part of the, the tactic? That well, I, I think what is clear is that Iran now, uh, and over the course of talks that have lasted over a year, has had every opportunity to make the kinds of commitments that the international community expects. Uh, and again, these are commitments that would shut down every pathway they have to a nuclear weapon uh, and, uh, and uh, comply with uh, intrusive inspections that would ensure that they're living up to the agreement. And, um, you know, they've had every opportunity to do that. They've had, uh, and you know, while talks continue to progress and while they continue to be productive, they'll continue to have that opportunity. Uh, but this is not an open-ended commitment to talking that we're willing to make here, that the time has come for Iran to make some decisions, uh, and we're hopeful that they'll do that. A quick question on Cuba. Uh, there were some talks yesterday between uh, Cuba and the U.S. about human rights. Did anything, any progress come out of those talks, and what's the, the, the administration's reaction to the, to the idea that Cuba is bringing up issues like police brutality and poverty okay. as uh, human rights, and also Guantanamo Bay as uh, human rights shortfalls by the U.S.? I haven't, uh, I haven't gotten a readout of those conversations, but we'll see if, uh, if there's something that we can share with you on that regard. Thanks, Josh. All right. Pamela. Hi. Um, on the uh, President's executive order today regarding the um, financial sanctions against hackers, mm -hmm. was there any effort or might there be any effort in the future to bring in the international community to join in sanctions like that, given that the threat crosses borders, could involve multinational corporations and that kind of thing? Mm -hmm. Well, the goal of uh, this uh, executive order that the President signed today is geared toward giving him an additional tool that can be used in response to significant acts of, um, significant malicious acts in cyberspace. And the idea here is that we want to make sure that whatever sort of response we have to those kinds of acts when they're carried out is proportional. Uh, and this would be uh, a set of tools the President could use to respond to uh, significant malicious acts in cyberspace. And um, the President is mindful of the threats that continue to exist in cyberspace. And these are threats that related to uh, cyber intrusions that occur in the private sector. We've seen uh, uh, healthcare companies and uh, financial institutions be victims of these kinds of intrusions. Uh, obviously, there are even some media outlets that have been uh, victimized by some of these attacks. Uh, there are obviously uh, government networks that have also uh, been subjected to uh, some uh, malicious uh, activity in cyberspace. We're mindful of all of that. And we want to make sure that the U.S. government has the resources and the tools necessary to respond forcefully to those incidents. And uh, that's the idea behind uh, this executive order. And uh, I guess to get directly to your question, uh, this is the kind of thing that other countries are looking at, too, uh, in terms of understanding that their countries or, uh, that their governments uh, and companies that are located in their countries uh, are similarly vulnerable uh, to these kinds of actions, uh, and that a coordinated response across the international community uh, is one that makes those uh, responses more effective. They also serve as a more effective deterrent as well, and that's part of the goal here. Um, and you know, I would anticipate that when the President does meet with other heads of state, uh, it's not uncommon for him to talk about uh, cybersecurity, 
uh, and I could certainly anticipate a scenario where he would discuss uh, this uh, proposed response as well. Okay. All right. Carol. Uh, Congress appears prepared to act either way that talks conclude. And so is it fair to say that you guys would support sanctions legislation that the President has said he would veto in the past while talks are ongoing? And if there is, in fact, a deal, are you guys open and willing to work with Congress on shaping some kind of legislation that you can live with either in the interim period from now until June 30th or after? Well, uh, Carol, what we would encourage members of Congress to do is uh, a couple of things. One is, uh, and we've made this case pretty aggressively, you alluded to it, that we do not believe it is in the best interest of the talks for Congress to take action on uh, additional sanctions while talks are ongoing. Uh, and uh, so that's why we've been you know, strongly opposed to some of the legislative proposals that have been floated so far. We continue to be strongly opposed to those. Uh, again, for reasons that Mara sort of highlighted, which is that uh, that would run contrary to the terms of the uh, interim agreement, the so-called joint plan of action that was reached uh, more than a year ago. Um, if we do reach an agreement, uh, this sort of this political uh, agreement, we would encourage members of Congress to evaluate that agreement on its merits. And I referred yesterday to this idea that uh, it will require members of Congress to sort of set aside their partisan interest uh, and try to keep the national interest uh, at the front of their mind and to evaluate uh, whether or not the President has followed through on the commitment that he's made uh, to use diplomacy to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. And uh, the President uh, has been clear to his negotiating team uh, that we're only going to take a good deal uh, and one in which Iran makes the necessary serious commitments to resolve the concerns of the international community. Uh, and so we will certainly have that conversation uh, with members of Congress uh, if a deal is reached when they return to Washington. And if one is not, then you'll back the legislation, some of the legislation that you currently oppose, right? Well, uh, uh, if, a, if a deal is not reached, there are a range of options on the table, including some options that Republicans, uh, well, or that members of Congress in both parties, frankly, have sought to put on the table now. Uh, we have opposed those, many of those provisions because we've said they shouldn't be on the table while we're engaged in negotiations. But yeah, if those negotiations break down and the Iranians walk away without willing, demonstrating a willingness to make some serious um, commitments, then that, then that does bring some of those issues back into play. But um, we'll, uh, we, you know, we'll evaluate that when, uh, when we come to it. Okay. Go ahead, Connie. Thank you so much, Jeff. In light of this tragic plane crash, would the President favor lifting privacy restrictions on pilots, train conductors, bus drivers, doctors, even White House press secretaries, anybody who holds the uh, public interest in their hands? Well, um, you know, these are, these are obviously matters where it's important for independent regulators to balance a couple of competing interests. Obviously, first and foremost in their mind uh, is ensuring the interest of the traveling public. Uh, and that's why the FAA, uh, the NTSB, and other uh, agencies like that have in place uh, regulations that, um, uh, that, that are related to the health and well-being of train conductors and, and, and airline pilots. Uh, obviously, uh, those individuals, just because they are uh, in that business, uh, don't uh, give up all of their uh, right to privacy. Uh, and trying to strike that right balance is uh, an important public policy question and certainly one that I'm sure the FAA spends a lot of time on. Uh, I will say that the FAA, when it comes to airline pilots, does have regulations that requires pilots uh, over the age of 40 to submit to a medical examination once every six months to ensure that they are um, fit to fly an aircraft that has uh, members of the traveling public on it. Uh, and those kinds of healthcare examinations include a component dedicated to their psychological health as well. Uh, and that's, a, that's an appropriate policy response. Okay. I didn't think this whole HIPAA system, this health care privacy system, should be reevaluated. Uh, I don't know that we have uh, 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 made that kind of pronouncement. Okay. Dave, I'll give you the last one. Thank you, I wanted to ask you about military retirement pay. The President sent a letter to the congressional leaders a couple days ago about the recommendations of an independent commission on military retirement pay and said he, it was an important step forward. Uh, to preserving the system, but he also wants the White House to work on refining some of the proposals. Can you outline in any more specificity what, what areas of concern the White House has about those recommendations? Uh, Dave, I'll confess I'm aware generally of this issue, but not of the finer points of our position on this. But let me have somebody follow up with you. We can do that with you today.
Okay. Thanks a lot, everybody. Have a good Wednesday.